The word of God from the 27th Psalm, David remembers God's protection. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers come against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. For he will conceal me in his shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me. God of my salvation, even if my father and mother abandoned me, the Lord cares for me. Because of my adversaries, show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brittany. The uh, text that she just read, uh, grab your Bible uh, or your, the app, or if you don't have a Bible, the, in the seat back in front of you on page 484, the, the uh, Psalm 27 is right there. You can follow along. Actually, you'll be helped to follow along as we dig into this chapter this morning. I want to thank Tim for the songs that we've already sang because it, I feel like he studied the text as much as I did uh, in picking those songs because they line up so wonderfully with what we're going to be talking about this morning. Everyone worries. Everyone has anxiety, myself included. Everyone experiences fear. And I'm not talking about phobias, such as fear of heights, which I have. I, I don't like uh, tall buildings, looking out windows of tall buildings, um, other situations like that. Um, but I don't think about that when I'm cutting the grass, because I'm not at 40 stories up in a building. I'm, I'm at the ground level. I only feel my heart speed up race when I'm looking out the window of a really tall building and my dislike of heights doesn't keep me up at night. But fear and worry and anxiety are what keep us up at night at times. God created us as emotional people and emotions, even fear, worry, and anxiety are given to us by God. They can be healthy and good. There's a time when you should be afraid. A bear is coming at you. That's an okay time to have fear. And we heard in the Sermon on the Mount series a sermon about anger, how that anger can be a righteous and good emotion, like when it's driven by a sense of injustice and a desire to oppose something that isn't fair and right. In the same way, fear is a God-given emotion. And that's when our mind alerts us to danger, either real or perceived. Anxiety is what we feel when our body is responding to the emotion of fear, and worry is the thought process that mulls over and over, gives power to the object of our fear. Here's another definition of fear that I found. Fear is the emotional response to circumstances that we perceive we cannot control and that will do us harm. Here's some examples of those kinds of fears that we all have experienced at times. What if something bad happens? What if I can't handle this situation? I did a little survey this week just asking people, what are some things that people fear? Here's some things specifically. Money, 
job security, relationships, or lack of relationships cause fear and anxiety, worry, health. Your health or the health of someone else causes fear, worry, and anxiety. Those are the most common ones. There's others. The weather. When there's a tornado alert, uh, we're watching the TV. Our anxiety may be heightened a little bit. Culture that we're in. Politics can cause anxiety where we're at. So what would this look like for you individually? Experiencing fear, worry, and anxiety. It could be that there's that family member who needs to trust Jesus, but they're just running as hard as they can away from him. And you're worried about their eternal state. Or maybe you're in the middle of a financial crisis yourself where the money runs out every month before the month runs out. Maybe the lab results from the doctor say that we need to run more tests. Anxiety comes up. Will the cancer come back again? Am I going to have enough money to retire someday? And there's this one that a lot of people in this room can relate to. Will my children be safe? Everybody feels these emotions differently, and they handle them differently. Some people find ways to cope with them. Exercise, activities that relieve stress, or silence and solitude. Those things are helpful. And here at Sojourn, though, we believe that the message of the gospel is for all of life. That scripture has something to say to us today about this. The psalm that Brittany read, and just happens to fall next in our line of the going through the Psalms as we've been. Psalm 27 was written by David. But when he wrote this Psalm, we're not sure exactly when he wrote it. But commentators say that it was most likely during the years that he was running from King Saul. You can read about this yourself in the 21st and 22nd chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. As we walk through this psalm today, I want to encourage you to imitate David. We're going to be looking at how Jesus responded to the people around him who had fear, worry, and anxiety. See, David admitted he was afraid, and he specifically identified it. He talked to himself, he talked to God, and then he talked to himself again. So let's dig into this. If you would look at your text. Let's look at verses 1 through 6 as Brittany read those to us. As I've read and studied this chapter, it helped me to use my imagination a little bit as I think about what David might have been doing as he wrote these words down. For these first six verses, let me, let me read through them real quickly. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers come against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a, a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. For he will conceive me in his shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent, he will set me high on a rock, then my head will be high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. So I imagine David talking to himself. That's what he's doing in these, in these verses. Maybe he's in a cave hiding from Saul at the time. He's walking through the woods at night where he can uh, be under the protection of darkness. He was in a bad spot. You see, he had been appointed king to replace Saul, but Saul didn't really buy into that transition plan that had been put into place. Saul felt the best way to stay king was to kill David. So he hunted him relentlessly for years. It's interesting to picture David here. In the first six verses of the psalm, he's not praying to God. He's talking to himself. He's reminding himself of the reality. 
with the Lord, there's no reason to fear. Starting in these six verses, the reality of the Lord's protection. Even in the midst of everything going on around him, he is confident in his Father. And it's not an unfounded confidence. He's basing it on his experience. And the source of that confidence, verse 4, says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord all my days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. Looking at the Lord, gazing on his beauty, instead of looking at his reasons for his fear, he's pursuing the Father. So a question for us is, where are our eyes when fear is an option? Notice that David is looking at the present. The Lord is my light. Right now, this very moment, the Lord is my light. He's looking at the past. He said, when evildoers came against me in the past, to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled in the past. A past action. The Lord protected me in the past. And they'll look in the future. He says, though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. He's surrounding himself with present, past, and future examples of the Lord's goodness to him. And he responds to himself. He says, then... Because of that, this is what will happen. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. This is what God will do. He will protect me, and then this will be my situation because of God's goodness to us. So maybe you right now are in a situation where you have heightened anxiety, worries that keep you awake at night, just an overdread of fear. So for you, it might sound something like this, a, a kind of self-talk to yourself. Right now, God is in control of every atom in the universe. I know that's true. I know he is with me. And I don't even know all the ways he's protecting me right now. At this very moment, he has protected me my entire life. Even though some things have happened that have not been pleasant, I believe even those good things were allowed by God for my ultimate good and for his glory. And because he has proven himself to be good and faithful to me today and yesterday, I know he will be good and faithful to me tomorrow, next week, and next year. I'm still going to have car trouble. I'm still going to have relationship issues. There will be doctor's visits in the future. There will be job situations that I can't control. But because of Jesus, it's temporary. Heaven is my home, not here. When I'm in heaven, 9,500 years from now, I don't think I'm going to worry about this because it's going to be well in my past. I can trust God. Self-talk. You're kind of telling yourself, preaching the gospel to yourself in a way to remind yourself of God's goodness. That's what David did. And then David prayed. If you look at these next few verses, verses 7 through 12, he was ready to pray then. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer to me. And stop right there. It's, it's as if there's just a tinge of doubt pops into David's mind. The importance and the desire to be in God's presence is still there, but now it's from the other side of doubt and confidence. And it's as if David is saying, God, please let me stay in your presence. Don't abandon me. And it's pretty encouraging to see that even in the middle of his doubt and his failing confidence, David looks to his father. We can look at how David's prayer is a model for us to pray when we have fear, worry, and anxiety. Looking at these verses again, 
Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me, God of my salvation. Even if, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord cares for me. Because of my adversaries, show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. Let's walk through these and just see what David is saying and how we can say the same things. First, we can know that God hears and answers us, even when we're doubting. We, we can see that God prompts him to pray. He says, my heart says this about you. Seek his face. God is, or David's acknowledging that something inside him is saying, seek God's face. Seek God's face. God does that for us as well. David, in these verses, reminds God, and he's reminding himself also, of God's past faithfulness. You have been my helper in the past, David says. David is looking to God as his father because he says, if my mother and my father abandoned me, the Lord cares for me. And then we can be specific in our prayers when we're afraid. He's very specific. These people who are speaking ill of me, protect me against them specifically. We can use David's prayer when we have fear, worry, and anxiety to pray to God. Nick had mentioned the resources that are out on the table. and Actually, those are not just for visitors, the ones on the, the big white table. We want to encourage everyone to pray. There's some larger books called The Praying Life. Um, if you would like to start a book club where you're reading about prayer and learning to pray together, they're free. There's no charge at all for those, the big books. Then there's 25 smaller books of, about how to start a praying life. It's a very short book. It can be read out loud in 30 minutes. I would encourage you to take those, one per family, um, and then as a family, get together, read it to each other. It will encourage you to pray. It will encourage you that God hears us. He wants us to pray to him. So, be great if that table were cleared off um, when you leave today. Ask God to help you push back against fear, worry, and anxiety by looking to him as the promise-keeping, all-loving, faithful God. <clears throat> and then we can look at how Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus responded to the people in his circles who had fear, worry, and anxiety. Because David wasn't the only person uh, in the Bible who experienced this. He, David returns to the confidence after a time of doubt and pleading with God not to abandon him. There is hope and the decision to wait, to be patient, and to have courage. Look at the last two verses. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. You notice he's not praying now. He's talking to himself again. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. There's a confidence there. It's as if he now, he's talked to himself, he's prayed, and he's saying, it's going to be okay. I can be confident in God. I need to be patient. I need to be strong. So how did Jesus address fear, worry, and anxiety that those around him were experiencing? See, he didn't just bring physical comfort. He addressed the spiritual significance of their anxiety. He taught those around him, and he teaches us to examine our fear, worry, and anxiety as clues into what, who we worship or what we worship at any given moment. So what are some examples of how we worship, how our worship shifts from worshiping God 
to something else due to fear, worry, and anxiety. Maybe we worship security, which is concerns about our financial stability, our health, or our personal safety. You know, it's possible to worship the approval of others. How others perceive us is more important to us than how God perceives us. We may worship control, which is a desire to control outcomes and situations undervaluing God's control. We may worship perfection. Anything less than perfection is unacceptable, we say. Material wealth can be something that's worshipped. Undermines the fact that God owns it all. And he controls the future. We could even make a, uh, an idol of worshipping failure. Because we, want, we make idols of success and achievement. We could even make ourselves or someone around us uh, more important than God. But in the New Testament, in Matthew, chapters 8 and 9, we're going to look at a couple chapters. And you can turn, if you like, to page 861. We're going to just talk through these quickly. By the way, that Bible in the seat back in front of you, if you don't have a printed copy of the Bible, uh, that one's yours. You take it right out that door with you. Uh, maybe go back uh, later this week, read through Matthew 8 and 9. And look at how Jesus interacted with those who had fear, worry, and anxiety. We see that one of the circumstances was a terminal illness. In chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, there was an ostracized leper. That's a, that's a situation we might have worry about. Another situation may be death of a loved one. Causes stress, anxiety. Jesus dealt with someone who had that happen, the centurion ruler, in Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Someone else had physical discomfort and sickness. That was Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus comforted. You see in verses, chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Spiritual oppression was someone was many people were afflicted with this. Jesus uh, responded to that need in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 8. There was a scribe who lacked contentment. His circumstance was financial security. Jesus responded to that, verses 18 through 22. Later in, in verses 23 through 27, Physical safety became the issue. Those that were in the boat with Jesus, he responded. Two men with demons, their issue with spiritual warfare definitely would be causing fear, worry, and anxiety. Verses 28 through 34. And then going into chapter 9, there were people with Jesus who were dealing with loss of their reputation. He ministered to them. There was a ruler with a dying daughter. The issue there was the suffering of a child. Verses, chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. And then the two blind men who had a permanent disability. Jesus dealt and ministered to those men. The point is, Jesus cares about you and your specific circumstances. What keeps you up at night? And he wants us to know that we don't have the power to control the outcome, but he does. And maybe today you are experiencing fear, worry, and anxiety, and you don't call yourself a follower of Jesus. Well, it might surprise you to hear me addressing everyone in the room as folks who have fear, worry, and anxiety. You may be thinking, wait a minute, these people are, they're supposed to have it all together. Well, we're kind of all a mess, aren't we? We have a saying around here, I'm an idiot. My future is incredibly bright. And 
anybody can get in on this. Followers of Jesus have not arrived yet. We're still works in progress. Sometimes, honestly, it's one step forward and two steps back. And that's okay. We're, we remind ourselves daily that we're accepted by God, not because of anything we've done or anything we haven't done, but because of what Jesus did. If you want to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus, ask the person who invited you. Or you can talk to me or Pastor Nick afterwards. We would love to chat with you. For those today who are already following Jesus, let me encourage you. Push back against your fears, worries, and anxieties by reminding yourself of God's faithfulness and directing your worship to him. A lot of you probably have the app on your phone. It just says Bible, you version. You can go to that app and you can find the topic, fear. It'll bring up verses that you can use, God's word to minister to you. Verses like Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he delivered me from all my fears. Or Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear. For I am with you. Do not dis be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Or sing hymns to yourself. Hymns like, in Christ alone. Or, it is well with my soul. Or, be still my soul. Self-talk. Singing those hymns of praise back to God, but you're also nurturing your own soul as you do that. You see, David reminded himself, he worshiped, he prayed, and he reminded himself again. That's not a bad pattern for us to follow either. Fear, worry, and anxiety are God-given emotions that when handled appropriately can benefit, can benefit us, but too often they end up handling us and controlling us. Fellow believers, know that you can trust God to handle things now as he has in the past and as he will for eternity. Let's pray. Father, as humans, we're weak. We become afraid when things are out of our control and we worry and we stress. You've been faithful to us, though. You are being faithful to us, and you will be faithful to us, and we know that you love us. Father, keep us from putting our fears before our worship of you. Amen. All right, I think Nick grabbed my notes.